All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Eckstein Hall and Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people uh, we often say are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today we are joined by Catherine Gale. She is the former CEO and president of Gale Foods. Some of you may be familiar with that name, prominent employer in the Milwaukee area for many years, many years. And uh, Catherine Gale has uh, since uh, left Gale Foods in that capacity. They sold the company. Uh, but she's become, well, I'll call you an activist, somebody who's an engaged citizen, who's very concerned about the state of our democracy. And she has just uh, co-authored a report for the Harvard Business School with the well-known economist Michael Porter. And the theme of that essentially is how our political industry is failing America. So we're gonna be talking about that today in this uh, next hour. So please give a warm welcome to Catherine Gale. Thank Glad you. Here. So I mentioned that you've written this paper and, and, and that's the way you kind of see yourself as an, an engaged citizen, as an activist. How, how did you make the transition from the business world to talking about our democracy? Well, I think it's a transition that uh, any of us can make, and, and candidly, it wasn't that I did one and then I moved to the other. There was certainly an overlap. So I worked for a time in uh, politics. I worked for Mayor Daley in Chicago in his administration and also at Chicago Public Schools. And then I returned to the private sector and was running Gale Foods in Germantown. So I was very concerned with US competitiveness, with our economic development, jobs, income growth, workforce development. So I cared about the public policy issues as a business person and spent time raising money for Barack Obama's political campaign in 2008. And I really dedicated a lot of time to that. And after his election, I was uh, very interested in the results that we were getting out of Washington. And I became disillusioned with those results and started to look into why that was so. Why did we have these enormous problems facing our country where in many cases there's widespread agreement between policymakers and politicians and academics, and yet we don't ever have the political will to act on them in government. And the answer I came up with is that it wasn't a question of who we were electing. It was a question of problems in the system itself, in the industry of politics, in the behavior that's incented. And so after I sold the business, I then had the opportunity to work in this area. And again, it's as an engaged citizen, I haven't become a politician or a political scientist or an expert. I have become someone who's able to put time into understanding this industry and be engaged in looking for solutions. Before we go any further, a couple things about Gail. This is a yeah. fourth generation company, correct? That's right. And, and so I'm sure you enjoyed that experience. Um, what from that experience did you take to the discussion that we're having today? You said you looked at it as a business person and said, why aren't we able to change these things? Um, but, but what else in the business experience has helped you? So the understanding of competition in business is what we're applying now to the political industry. Previously, I would have thought, well, politics is not like an industry, politics is somehow different because people are motivated by how to make life better for the constituents that they're serving. And yet it turns out that politics, while not needing to be run like a business, politics responds to competitive incentives the same way business does. And so I was able to look at how we analyze competition in business, and we all say in the United States, a capitalist system, that competition helps drive companies to produce better results for the consumers, because I want you to buy my products instead of your products. So why isn't competition producing better results in the political industry. And we use the exact same analysis that we would traditionally use in business, which is why I wrote this report with an economist from Harvard Business School. We use the five forces, and it becomes clear that the political industry, which we'll get into, is a duopoly to competitors, 
and they're not necessarily incented to need to serve the consumer. So it is precisely the business background that enabled us to look at this with some fresh non-political eyes. So before I go any further, you, you said you became disillusioned at, at some of what you were seeing, and, and you have described yourself in the past as a Democrat, but today I see you describe yourself as a proud independent. Is that an accurate description of your politics today? Yeah, I, there's some several adjectives, actually. First of all, I like to say I'm politically homeless. Um, <laughs> maybe some of that resonates for you. Uh, and I am a proud independent, a centrist, a pro-problem-solving, non-ideological citizen who wants to see government deliver on its promise to the citizens. And that is not uh, an ideology that fits with either of the parties. So I'm an independent, but I'm definitely a centrist independent. Let's talk about the, the uh, report that you've co-authored with uh, Michael Porter, The Economist. Um, the, the crux of it is, is that um, we are less competitive because we don't solve our big problems. Um, and you point to, and you've used the word already, the political industry as, as the problem, that it's failing America. Specifically, how is our political system, the politics industry, failing America? I'm sure that everyone in here could give their own answer of something that you and your community feel strongly needs to be done and we're not accomplishing. The example that I often give is some work that came out of Harvard on US competitiveness. So if you think about it, the one of the key functions of the federal government needs to be to create a foundation upon which businesses can succeed and at the same time employees can succeed, meaning have high and rising standards of living. You can't have employees succeeding artificially or only business succeeding and be truly competitive. So that's a fundamental um, requirement of the federal government. Harvard Business School did this work and determined that businesses were in many cases succeeding well, employees not so much, so the economy is only doing half its job, and identified eight policy priorities that if you executed on those priorities, that would change the tr competitiveness trajectory. We would have a more competitive economy. And there's wide agreement behind closed doors. Everybody knows that's what you need to do. But we don't do any of it. And so I'll give you a couple examples. We are not fiscally responsible. We have a $19 trillion debt. We didn't pass Simpson-Bowles, which was a major bipartisan compromise on debt deficit reduction. Um, it died a bipartisan death. It's amazing how quickly people stopped talking about the issue of a nation's debt. They did, except here, because you had Reed Ribble and had a very nice conversation. That's um, true, we did, actually. Right, so we're kudos, the trend, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, no, it, it is amazing, because fundamentally, we are weakening our opportunity to create future opportunities for our citizens if you know we are that much in debt. So, so that's a big problem, and there are other, you know, similar problems in our education system, in immigration, in infrastructure, tax reform, which the broad outlines of solutions have been drafted for years. But the parties are not incented to deliver on those solutions. Yeah, describe for me the politics industry as, as you see it today. What exactly are we talking about? Okay, so how many of you here have ever said, or been, where someone says, Washington is broken? Okay, it's not you know, super innovative to say that. But here's what we discovered. Washington actually is not broken. The problem is, it's not designed to serve the citizens, us. It's designed for the benefit of private gain-seeking organizations, meaning our political parties and all of their industry allies. So the pollsters, the media, the lobbyists, um, everyone involved in campaigns and governing creates an entire industry. We call it the political industrial complex. And 
how things work in Washington has been designed to support the growth and power of all the players in that political industrial complex. And they are, at the same time as consumers are wildly dissatisfied, really thriving. So that industry, think about the politics industry. It's got more money, more power, uh, growth opportunities, despite the fact that their consumers don't like it. And, and that raises, well, that, but that raises an interesting question. And the question is, if people are unhappy, and, and let's face it, 40% of eligible voters in America did not vote in the presidential election in 2016. 40% did not vote. So there's obvious dissatisfaction. There's obvious uh, uh, a feeling of disenfranchisement for many Americans. So in a typical business environment, somebody would come in and say, hey, I'm going to appeal to those folks. That's a market mm -hmm. that I should be able to reach these people and, and convince them I've got a better idea. I've got a new product. Why hasn't that happened? That is the crux of the problem. So, and, and let me just add, before I answer that, a couple other facts. Not only did 40% not vote in the, ele in the presidential election, 40% of Americans self-identify as independents, which is greater than the amount that identify as either Republicans or Democrats, which is 30 each. So why isn't there uh, an offering for those 40%? And Congress has a 15% approval rating, but a 96% re-election rating. OK, so that's not, you don't really buy a product again that you're dissatisfied with, except in this industry. And so here's why. Because the duopoly doesn't get much done, we say, what do we say? Two parties equals zero results. Um, but what they do get done is they work together to protect themselves jointly from competition. And I'd like to just give you an example. So this isn't the example that ruins everything. It's just an example of behind the scenes, the way the parties and the political industrial complex have rigged things over the years such that competition can't enter. So remember when Joe Biden became the vice president? Mm -hmm. So now his Senate seat in Delaware is open, and everybody in Delaware knew in 2010 midterm elections who the next senator from the state of Delaware was going to be. And that was a guy named Mike Castle. Mike Castle had been their congressman, their uh, governor, and he was widely considered the most popular politician in the state of Delaware. And he's a Republican. Um, and no problem, so he could have been measuring his drapes, I'm not sure, but he just ran in his primary, because that's what you have to do first, and he lost in the primary, because you remember there were Tea Party primaries at that time in 2010. 30,000 people voted in that primary, and they, um, they selected a woman named Christine O'Donnell instead of the most popular politician. So the answer really would be, I would say to Mike, well, no problem. That's just the primary. Barely anyone voted in that. So just run as an independent in the general election, and then you'll win, and you will be Senator Mike Castle. So why doesn't Mike Castle take that great advice? Because, well, A, I wasn't there, but because um, he couldn't. Delaware has a law. And this law, it's kind of odd, it's called the sore loser law. <laughs> and what that says is, if you run in either party's primary and you lose, you are not allowed to present yourself to the general electorate on the ballot as an independent. So that small group of primary voters controls the access to the general election ballot and controls the choices that the people in Delaware have. Crazy. Now, the question then is, that is super undemocratic law. That's how I think of it. So how many states have that law? How many states have a sore loser law? Well, it's 44. And we're living in one. Now, they either, just to be clear, states either have this because they have a specific law. I mean, they don't write it in the, in the laws as the sore loser law, but that's what they're called. You can look it up on Wikipedia, actually. 
And uh, they can do that or they have registration dates that accomplish exactly the same intent. Remember when Joe Lieberman had run for vice president and then he lost his Senate primary in Connecticut? But he ran as an independent in Connecticut and was reelected, proving that Connecticut Connecticutians, would, I'm not sure. OK, the people of Connecticut wanted Joe Lieberman. Why could he do that? Because Connecticut was one of only four states at that time without a sore loser law. In almost every other state, the people would not have been able to have the senator they wanted. The reason I bring that example up is because that is emblematic of the rigged behind-the-scenes rulemaking that has gone on unbeknownst to us, cementing the ability of these two parties to keep out additional competition. They, if you think about it, I mean, as much as they're fighting against each other, they're not like upset that there's one other competitor, but they definitely do not want to cede any ground to a third choice, and this is why we do not solve our problems. Because they're not accountable at the ballot box. They're not even accountable for the th doing the things they said they were gonna do. All they have to do is have you believe that they're like slightly less bad than the other side, or at least they're saying things that you believe in even though you sort of know they're not really gonna follow through. That is not a recipe for good governance and for delivering results for all of us and our families. I think you've said that uh, in, in, in your uh, report two things, that the founding fathers, <clears throat> the political process as we see it today would be unrecognizable to the founding fathers. The people make a lot of assumptions about how our process works, but, but we've sort of developed the process and it's, it's a lot more complicated mm -hmm. than probably anyone could have ever envisioned. Mike, you're right. Uh, John Adams said, let's see if I can remember it precisely, there is nothing I dread more than the division of our republic into two rival parties, each, uh, each arranged under its leader, concerting measures in opposition to each other. And yet that's where we've come. And, Let's remember, as you're indicating, most of what we have come to accept as the way our political system works is just invented. It's not in the Constitution. The Constitution has nothing to say about political parties or partisan primaries or um, gerrymandered districts or committee chairs or the rulemaking in Congress. This, these are things that have been invented over time. And the players in the industry have been incented to invent things that work for them and we're not really paying attention. So as part of my transition back to your earlier question, one of my transitions was, wow, I'm not gonna spend two years of my life working hard to elect who are a great candidate just to send them into a completely dysfunctional system which is way more powerful on the results they're going to deliver than even who they are when they come to that uh, you know, position. I'm gonna spend my time on the root causes that lead good, well-intentioned elected officials to act in ways in order to ensure their reelection, essentially, that are counter to what we want them to do and to what many of them have got to know is not what uh, is good. You mentioned earlier that about 40% of Americans identify themselves as independents. Let me push back on that a little bit. One of the things you'll hear from uh, people in the politics industry is that they're not really independents, that if you push them just a little bit, you'll see they vote mostly Democratic or they vote mostly Republican. So the notion that there are all these people out there in the middle who are disenfranchised and don't feel like the things are applying to them, actually, when you look a little closer, they might look a little more like a Democrat or a Republican. What do you say to that? 
I say that a friend of mine has a great analogy for this. So his name's Charlie Whelan. Um, Dartmouth professor, right? You're right, mm -hmm. wrote the Centrist Manifesto, and which I commend to all of you, the Centrist Manifesto. Anyway, here's what Charlie points out. So saying what you've just established, that, oh, they're really all closet Republicans or Democrats, is like saying that Americans um, don't like lobster because every time they go to the buffet, they either take chicken or beef. Well, there's no lobster on the buffet. <laughs> so it's just a completely erroneous conclusion. And until we are able to put forward the centrist candidates with the rational pro-problem solving message that we believe represents what a large portion of those 40% self-identified independents are looking for, we are not going to um, you know, have that answer. But I'm sure they're, I'm just totally sure they're wrong. So, so let's talk about solutions or, or reforms that you have um, proposed, that uh, you and uh, Michael Porter propose. I want to begin with one that's actually being used in, in the state of California, for instance, and that is the notion of nonpartisan primaries. And, and I, I'd like you to explain how that works to people here in the audience, but also what you, in an ideal world, would like to see in terms of nonpartisan primaries. Can I step back quickly just to outline the criteria for any solution? Yeah. Before sure. I get into this specific one? Okay, so. I'm glad you asked me about solutions because I'm happy to comment on the situation, but really the entire purpose is to figure out how to drive to actions that if we took them would change the ability of the system and the likelihood that it would deliver results for real families. So what we found after we analyzed the system is we can also then analyze potential political reforms, because there's a zillion reforms out there. Everybody's got a website and a name, and they're raising money for their reform, and figure out which ones would make a difference. And what we do is we draw two circles. One is we say, is this reform powerful? Me, and the criteria is, would it change a systemic incentive that incents a certain behavior today and change that in a way that would be valuable? And then the second thing is, is it achievable? Because there are a lot of theoretically powerful ideas that require constitutional amendments. So they might fit in powerful, but they don't fit in achievable. And then we look at the intersection of powerful and achievable. And the good news is, is that there are actually a number of reforms that are both powerful and achievable. Now there is, and I'm sure you know this intuitively, nothing at the intersection of powerful, achievable, and easy. Not that that, OK? But we do have powerful and achievable. So the one that you talked yeah, about, nonpartisan non primaries. primaries in California, is one of my absolute priorities. We believe that partisan primaries are the single biggest structural impediment to bipartisan compromise legislation on the difficult issues where there's no easy answer, which is you know, mostly the issues we have left because the official who's been elected and is now, let's just say, in Congress thinking, am I going to vote for this bipartisan Simpson-Bowles compromise legislation? Am I going to vote for immigration reform? Am I going to vote for corporate tax reform? Am I going to you know, do any of these things? Has one, well, they have two primary concerns. How does it affect their fundraising? But the second one is, Am I going to get reelected? And when they say, am I going to get reelected, what they really mean is, am I going to make it through my partisan primary? And if you remember from Sore Losers, very few people vote in partisan primaries. And it tends to be further ideologically left or right people. So they are answering only to a very small subset of voters, because they can't even get to the general election ballot. So the partisan primary voter is way more powerful than any other. I always say if you can only vote once, just go to the primary. You should go to both. But So what California did is they said, we're not going to have separate primaries for these gain-seeking organizations anymore. We're going to have one ballot. So if you go to a primary in California, 
you just get the primary ballot for this House seat or this Senate seat, and everybody's listed on there. And then the top two vote getters advance. So if you are in a heavily Democratic district, it's possible that out of your primary, the top two vote getters will both be Democrats, but then that actually creates competition within the Democratic Party. Right, so there's comp right, exactly, there's competition there. You'll find someone appealing to, you know, different, different ideas for the public. And this is very important when you go back to Washington, D.C., because think again of our legislature, the legislator who previously said, oh, I can't vote for that because I won't make it through my partisan primary. They can say, hmm, I might come in second in my nonpartisan primary, you know, because I'm going to vote for this thing that everybody knows needs to be done, but the people who turn out in the primary are not going to like me very much. But at least I can squeak through my nonpartisan primary in second place, and I will be rewarded in the general election because I did the right thing for the citizens of my state or my country. That change would make a big difference. Uh, something else you favor, um, nonpartisan redistricting. And, uh, and this is not the, the usual way redistricting is done. Uh, let's face it, most, most states, um, the political parties do the redistricting. Um, why would that change things so dramatically in your opinion? It's, so uh, it's related. It's the combination of partisan primaries with partisan redistricting, which we call gerrymandering. And that together, those two things knitted together create this disincentive to solve any problems because you're never going to win. Because it just means that if your partisan primary is Democrat, a Democratic primary, and you're in a district that's been artificially drawn to favor Democrats, then clearly you know whoever wins the Democratic primary is the one who's going to win the general. That just makes that Democratic primary more important than ever. So what we say is that you should have nonpartisan primaries and you should also have districts that are drawn for non-political reasons. It's talked about that the way it's drawn now by legislat legislatures state legislatures, is they draw them where the politicians choose their voters. Yep. Oh, I think I'll draw it in shape like this. You know it's called gerrymander because Elbridge Gerry, who was the governor of Massachusetts, I don't know, over 150 years ago or so, drew a district that looked like a salamander. And so that's why we have gerrymandering. So point, and, but you can draw better salamanders today because technology is so good that you know exactly how these people vote and those people vote, so you can optimize that. Point being, they, uh, they will draw these you know, districts, and we want to see that be drawn in a nonpartisan way. And then if you combine nonpartisan redistricting with a nonpartisan primary together, that's a real change. Does it, does it make everything function just like clockwork? Of course not, still democracy. We still have 300 million people you know, wanting different things, needing different uh, things, but it gives us a chance. Whereas right now, we just get, when you, once you look at these systemic incentives, you just get, oh, I get that they're really not gonna do what we need done. So in today's world, how do we, in, uh, something you wanna see happen, how do we get to Nonpartisan redistricting, and that, that sounds like a pretty big, uh, a pretty heavy lift. Yeah. Again, as I said, nothing at the intersection of powerful, achievable, and easy. But we did have that as achievable, and all of the reforms that we talk about, and I hope you'll all read the paper when it comes out in March, uh, have a different strategy for achievement. So some of them need legal action to be achieved. Some of them need legislative action. Some of them need voter, um, voter action. And the strategy also may be different state by state because almost all of these rules, like the sore loser law is a state by state. How redistricting done is state by state. So you're gonna have to change them state by state. 
Redistricting is really exciting for those of us in this room because we can be very thrilled, assuming you agree with this idea, that right now the biggest opportunity to change the game and make that process not a process for the citizens instead of for private political parties is happening in Wisconsin. There's a lawsuit that uh, was brought. In this case, our state was gerrymandered by Republicans because they controlled the state legislature and the uh, governor's governorship after the last uh, census. So the Republicans redistricted our state. Other states are controlled by Democrats, and Democrats redistrict there. Believe me, it's an equal opportunity um, practice. But so in our state, there was a lawsuit brought against this Republican gerrymander, and we won. And I say we because I was involved in uh, supporting that financially and raising money for it, although I wasn't the person who made it happen in any way. But um, I'm just happy to be part of it. So we won, and now Wisconsin is being required to redraw the maps before the next elections. Now Wisconsin, meaning the current Republican-controlled state legislature, is appealing this to the Supreme Court. If it gets, and assuming that goes through, and the Supreme Court has to take this, they're not allowed to say we're not taking it because it's a redistricting lawsuit, and we win, that would pave the way to make political, politically motivated drawing of districts unconstitutional around the country. It is so exciting because the likelihood that you're going to go state by state and get state legislatures to give up a power that benefits them, that's a tough road. It would be easier, still worthwhile no matter what, but easier if we can win this lawsuit, and I believe we will. I want to touch on a couple of other uh, things you've talked about. Um, and and I, one of them deals with campaign finance. and. Um, this, again, is, a, is not a simple uh, thing to, to do in, in our country. There have been uh, court rulings on this that um, I think make uh, campaign finance reform pretty, pretty tricky. Um, so how do we get to the point that you'd like to see where we have 100% transparency on political spending? Um, how do we reach that point given the law of the land as we know it today? Yes, so in early drafts of this report that's coming out, we did not present campaign finance ref reform as being at the intersection of powerful and achievable. However, there are you know, brilliant, dedicated people working on this because we know it is at the core. I mean, we still need to, you can't just change one of these things, you've got to change enough of them to you know, make a substantive collective difference. There are people working on it, and uh, some of them actually, I would say, in some ways been lobbying to be part of this you know, set of reforms. And I have become convinced that there are a couple of groups, Issue 1, Campaign Legal Center, who's also behind the redistricting lawsuit, who are putting together a long game you know, they got a long strategy, they call it Victory 2021, to change the game on money and politics. And that means that they are going to take little wins, state and locally. They're going to develop a new theory of jurisprudence. They're going to put a lot of resource behind figuring out what money and politics legislation can we draft and regulations can we put in place that would withstand court scrutiny. Their job has been made enormously difficult by the court rulings that you refer to, but they see hope, and we do know over our history that rulings of the court on certain issues can change over time. So there are people invested in this that I feel strongly are on the right track, and um, I'm, going, I'm definitely adding that to powerful and achievable at this point. Something else you've talked about um, is whether or not uh, it's possible to elect, for example, four centrists, the word you use, four centrists to the U.S. Senate. 
which in your opinion would change greatly the dynamic and the incentives for Democrats and Republicans to cooperate. Is that realistic that for independents, how would that happen given the duopoly that exists today? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Mike, what you're bringing up is something that we call the Senate fulcrum strategy. So, you know, a fulcrum is a lever. I mean, that's about as far as I go in physics. But <laughs> the idea is we want to do all these systemic reforms, and it's going to take, even at best, you know, five to 10 to 15 years, even if we get all of you working on it full time right now. What could we do in the meantime that might make a more immediate difference? And we call this hacking the system. You've heard of you know, system hacks. So how could we not change any of the incentives and still get some different results right away? And that's what you're referring to, which is let's go into the US Senate and work to elect let's call it um, you know, four independent, centrist, pro-problem solving US senators who would deny, theoretically, either party a majority, so you could have 48, 48, and four, and now these four who were elected specifically to solve problems for the American people and do something different than what's been done become the most powerful swing coalition in the United States Senate, and neither party can make something happen without aligning with these four. So they can take a position that has been traditionally favored by Democrats or another position traditionally favored by Republicans and align with one in one case and one on the other and move legislation forward. Is it doable? Well, not easy, but powerful and achievable. Let me give you an example. Every senator is you know, worth the same vote. So you've got 100, and we only need four. If you ran four races, let's just assume we're going to win them all, OK? So let's run four races, $50 million a race, which is a nice budget. Un unfortunately, it's a required budget in most states. You win those races. That means. It cost $200 million to fundamentally, which is a lot of money, but let's put it in perspective. $200 million to fundamentally change the ability of the United States Senate to pass out of their chamber broad compromise problem-solving legislation on the biggest problems of our day, that is a deal. Um, it's, it's definitely doable. We can pick the states. We can find the right candidates. We can find a motivated electorate. And if we have enough money, and I'm, again, I, I wish we all could contribute you know, $50 matched by the state, and there would be campaign finance caps and all of that. But since there's not, we'll use the super PACs and we'll elect these senators, and we can make a difference right away. So we have to find candidates, and that leads me to the obvious question. Um, because uh, I, you know, it, it, I was saying to uh, uh, Catherine Gale when she arrived here today that um, I've probably had a number of individuals involved in the politics industry ask me, so what is Catherine Gale up to? What is she doing? Is she going to run for office? Is, is this just all a pretense for for a candidacy, and so I'll give you a chance to address that. Uh, would you be interested in being one of those independent U.S. senators or an independent candidate for governor? Or are you thinking about that? I, I'm totally going to answer your question, but do they really say, is that a pre, like what I'm doing, it's a pretense? Well, I think they wonder. They want, because I, that's probably my choice of words, okay. but I think they see that as they wonder, what is she up to? That yeah. is the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer it. All right, so I might. I might run. Um, but, oh, <laughs> well, now I really might. <laughs> um, so. Soon? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> not soon. Um, not soon. Here's, let me explain to you a little my thought process on this. I mean, I am all in for this state, for this country for the results that we achieve. One of the reasons I sold my business was because life is short. I have an 11-year-old daughter. I 
We want to see the opportunities for her that we all want to see for our families. I mean, I'm just, I'm just all in for this stuff. It makes me a little emotional, actually. Having said that, I'm not, I'm not a political junkie. I mean, it's not like my life's ambition to run for office. What I really care about is the results that we can generate for real people. So I have to say, well, would I be able to you know, do that? And right now I've evaluated that the best way to do that is to work systemically, because I think that any one individual candidate can only make so much, you know, or, any, or someone who wins can only make so much happen. And the problem also comes down to making a smart decision, which is, as I've described myself, if you'll allow me to you know, sort of do it again, which is that I'm a independent, rational, pro-problem-solving, non-ideological, centrist, politically homeless business person, and that just doesn't fit well in the process of the industry that I've just described to you. So if I see a path as an independent centrist candidate, then I would take that. Or if I saw a path in a trans, I'm not opposed to Republicans and Democrats, in a transformed Republican or Democratic Party, then I would be interested in being a part of that. At the moment, I've evaluated that I can make the most difference by bringing these reforms forward. Because let me tell you what would be great. The same way, and, and I appreciate your applause, for example, encouraging me maybe to run. What we need is to be able to see so many fabulous people running and running into a system where they can then deliver. So if I'm part of something that delivers a system where then we have lots of choices of great candidates that we actually believe will be able to do something when they get there, that's a victory that I'm for. Two quick questions, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, so just to be clear, you don't see yourself as a candidate for U.S. Senate in 2018 or a candidate for governor in 2018? No. You don't. Okay. Uh, here's my other question, Donald Trump. Uh, seriously, this is, he is, in many respects, he was supposed to be the change agent. He was supposed to do things differently. He was supposed to shape things up. Granted, he's not even a month into his, uh, his first term. But how does that affect what you're talking about? Does that make some of what you're talking about no longer the case? And let's also remember that Obama campaign in 2008 was change we can believe in. We are consistently voting for change. And there's a reason for that, because we need it. But let me tell you what I think about uh, the Donald Trump election. I think he is disruptive, but not transformational to the industry that I've described today. In the end, Donald Trump was not a traditional Republican, and Bernie Sanders, for example, was not a traditional Democrat. But they both chose to run square in the middle of the existing duopoly because they evaluated that they wouldn't have a chance to run outside of the existing duopoly. And when they run in it, then they're still a part of it. And if we look at it now, there's nothing that leads me to believe that any of the structural incentives for the behavior of Washington overall, because much bigger than just the president, are going to change as a result of Donald Trump having been elected. The Republicans and Democrats who have to send the legislation up to the president still have to respond to their donors, their special interests, and their primary partisan primary voters. And those are, you know, the incentives that are really delivering the, the results that we have. So it's really instructive to note that, that Donald and, uh, you know, that President Trump and Bernie Sanders ran as part of the duopoly because it just tells us how difficult it is to run outside of it. And even though he got elected, it doesn't change what we need to do, because let's just pretend for a moment that he got elected and he got all kinds of fabulous things done, which I don't think is the direction we're going. Um, 
it wouldn't mean that the next candidate was going to be able to do that. We've got to get ourselves a system that incents the right behavior ongoingly. So we're not waiting for a savior to make it happen for us. Let me take a few questions from the audience. Those of you who've been with us before know how this works. If you're in the seating bowl down here in the bottom, you press on the rim, not on the ball, but on the rim. Keep your finger down on the rim. And if you're in the back, you'll wait for Ryan, who's in the blue shirt today. He'll come over and hold the microphone as you ask your question. Again, no speeches, just uh, brief questions. We'll get to as many as possible. I'm going to start in the back today. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, hello. Um, as a self-described centrist who mentioned working in Chicago public schools, where do you stand on public education? Should we continue expanding charter and voucher school options with varying degrees of accountability, or should we return to focusing on democratically controlled public schools uh, or something else? So when I, w I have a master's degree in education, and early in my career, I thought that's where I would spend the bulk of my time. And I was thrilled to work at Chicago Public Schools. When I left there to go over to work for Mayor Daley on economic development, I had a view which uh, saddened me then and does now. I would say that at that time, uh, we didn't know what it would take to transform the schools. You know, so I was part of the system, and I would say that it wasn't that we couldn't get it done. We didn't actually know what we needed to do. I think that that remains in large part a challenge. I think that people sometimes fight over this issue of public, uh, you know, voucher, charter, as if one of these things is by themselves the answer. And the challenge is bigger than that, which is, you know, they, they, we're in warring camps over our ideas on it, but it's not clear to me which one, you know, delivers for the students. I have recently participated in a forum, actually it was at Harvard Business School, on education, and I would have been similarly saddened by the state of our knowledge of what we can do to transform education, except that I met there a group of younger educators who are leading with technology and using technology as an innovation, a transformative innovation to deliver education. And they were on fire. And the results that they explained to me that they are able to deliver represent, I believed, the kind of transformation that I had been looking for. So for me, the answer is not, am I for voucher schools, charter schools, or public schools? It's what do we do in any one of those settings that is going to actually reach that child to allow them to you know, bring out their potential. So it's a transformation of what's happening in education, not the type of structure that that education, you know, that it's called, because a child doesn't care that they're in a charter school or a voucher school or a public school. Now, I will say, however, that in order to get that kind of innovation and have it be widespread, that is a political challenge. And I think that the Democratic Party has not, uh, has allowed itself to be too captive to teachers unions over time such that they do not look with an open mind at what we're gonna need to change to get that transformation educational experience. Not again the transformational education you know, structure, charter, voucher, public, but the educational experience because people are afraid of change. And the Democratic Party has um, given in to that. The Republican Party, on the other hand, 
takes, you know, they paint once again with a broad brush in general that um, we need to throw all of that out. And clearly we don't because we know that individual teachers are dedicated to, you know, educating those students. We've got to get to a point, though, where the elected officials on both sides can do what's right for the students instead of responding to the special interests, adults who are voting in their primaries. Let's take another question. Let me uh, look around. I don't want to ignore my friends over here on the right. I feel like sometimes my back's turned. <laughs> Not giving you folks enough love, so I apologize for that. Um, let's go up here. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, enjoy your comments very much today. Um, going back to the gerrymandering um, and the lawsuit in Wisconsin, it, you said could be kind of a benchmark. Um, but if I'm understanding that lawsuit correctly, it would go back to the Republicans to redraw the lines. So, um, come kind of like 360 mm -hmm. on that then. So, places like, I believe it's Iowa, and um, I think it's Arizona, and maybe Florida have non or uh, bipartisan ways of drawing their lines. Do you want to comment on that? If we're going to go back to the same group that drew the lines initially? Yes. So, what you're referring to is the court in this case did not. Uh, decide to draw the lines instead of the legislature. They said, hey, this is a partisan gerrymander. That is not OK. You redo it. So they sent it back to the legislature, which is controlled still by the Republicans. Having said that, two things. One, the case was won in part by an innovative algorithm, a formula that demonstrates when a redistricting plan is a partisan political gerrymander. So it is not the problem, apparently, I understand, with previous cases that made it to the Supreme Court was that the case was asking people to sort of say, yeah, I know it when I see it. I can recognize a salamander versus you know, not, and that's a partisan gerrymander. But the Supreme Court said, that's not good enough. You can't just know it when you see it. So the, one of the big innovative um, breakthroughs in this court case is that there's a, a formula. Point being, when you send it back to the Republican legislature to draw it, they're going to have to draw districts that can pass that formula. So it's, it's fine if Republicans draw it as long as it's not partisan, as long as it, and this would be a test for that. Additionally, sending it back to the legislature doesn't mean that they couldn't decide that they would select a nonpartisan commission to draw it for them. It's perfectly okay for them to do that to say, well, we're not going to you know, sit behind closed doors with our attorneys and our computers the way we did the last time. We're going to have a different process and get a commission. So there are different uh, friend of the court briefs that are being filed now suggesting different ways to do it. I don't have, I don't know how that's going to play out, but it's fine that the court didn't decide to draw it because, in my view, we want a long-term solution, which is, Legislatures across the country are going to have to figure out how they, even though they're partisan, draw something fair where voters get to choose their politicians instead of the other way around. Um, or, you know, I mean, we have to figure out how they're going to, how they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Please raise your hand. Let's go back here, Ryan. Hi. Um, regarding your report coming out in March, what are you hoping, best case scenario, that a policymaker sees it and it pushes forward some challenges to the duopoly, or is it sort of just spreading awareness? Mm -hmm. I would love to see policymakers take this up, but they won't because they're not currently incented to. So they won't take it up until it's something that matters to their donors, their special interests, or their partisan primary voters. And 
that's not likely going to happen. So what we're hoping for from our report is yes, spreading awareness, but definitely only spreading awareness for the purpose of motivating some hopefully large subset of people who got that awareness to actually take action. And that action will be different state by state because the laws, regulations, and rigged politics have to be changed on a state by state basis. In some cases, we're gonna have legal action. In some cases, you have to elect different people to make the change. Um, in other places, and this is likely where it will start, you'll have citizens' initiatives. So we don't have initiative partitions in Wisconsin, but there's about 27 states that have some form of the ability for citizens of that state to put ballot initiatives on their elections. And that, for example, is how California got their nonpartisan primary is because it was a ballot initiative. So they bypassed the state legislature to get the nonpartisan primary and, in that case, also nonpartisan redistricting. So the first order of business will be to mobilize in 27 states to go for ballot initiatives for several of these reforms. Additionally, we hope that this analytical lens, this business lens of viewing politics as an industry responding quite rationally to the existing incentives will inspire people, business leaders, and what we're calling political philanthropists to invest in change. I'll say something about political philanthropy. Again, I'm not for money in politics. I want money out of politics, but in the meantime, money's in. So I'd like to see something a friend of mine, David Crane, said, a special interest for the general interest. And I'll tell you how that might come about. So this makes sense with your question, it really does. Okay, so Bill and Melinda Gates have a giving pledge, and they ask billionaires to say that they pledge to donate half of their you know, wealth before they die. And that pledge now has commitments of about $250 billion of philanthropy, which is extraordinary. I mean, it's super generous and can't say enough about it. Having said that, we need to put that philanthropy in perspective, which is that $250 billion is the amount of money that state governments across the country spend in one month. And it's the amount of money that the federal government spends in three weeks. So $250 billion donated over lifetimes will not change the trajectory of the causes that's donated into, like healthcare or anti-poverty or education, no matter how many charter schools are funded, if we do not fundamentally change the ability of government to deliver better results for all the money, the magnitudes of, of dollars that they are spending. So we invite philanthropists to turn their attention to political philanthropy, to transforming the structural incentives in government, because that is the best return on investment, we believe, for anybody who cares deeply about causes where government plays the major role. And we hope that this analysis provides an investment rationale for them not to think, oh, I just wouldn't even know how to make a difference in government, you know, or worse, for people who say, well, it's so rigged that the best I can do is just to contribute some dollars in to make sure that my companies get my share. This analysis provides a rationale to see that their investment could make a difference. I'm going to have to wrap things up there. Before we go, I uh, want to encourage you to check out our uh, website, law.marquette.edu. We have uh, some new events on there that we've added to the schedule, and we hope you'll be able to attend some of those. Um, also want to mention uh, what we have coming up next week. Uh, on Wednesday, we will have the Milwaukee County Executive Chris Abley. That will be a full room. And then on Thursday, we will have the... Uh, the chairs of the governor's task force on the opioid epidemic will have Lieutenant Governor uh, Clay Fish and Representative John Nygren, whose daughter has battled uh, heroin addiction. They will be here in this room to talk about what we can do, at least in terms of the legislative branch, to address uh, what is a, a epidemic 
not just in Milwaukee County, but all across our state. So having said that, I'll wrap it up by, um, again, thanking everybody in this room for your interest and your attention and for spending an hour with us, and we hope to see you next time on the issues. Again, a thank you to Catherine Gale for being with us today. Thank you. That's great.